Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Dean of the USC Dornsife College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences, Amber Miller. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for what promises to be an engaging conversation spanning politics, culture, and public life. Since 1999, the Carmen and Lewis Warshaw Lecture has brought some of our nation's most impressive contributors to public life here to USC. They share ideas about their work and how their Jewish heritage has influenced their thinking. We greatly appreciate the support and friendship of the Warshaw's daughter, Hope, who is here with us this evening. Given the boring year we've had in national politics, <laughs> we wondered if we'd be able to find anything at all on the subject of public life that would be interesting. But I think we've managed to find someone who will hold your attention. Tonight, we welcome one of America's preeminent legal scholars and practitioners, Professor Lawrence Tribe. He is the Carl M. Loeb University Professor and Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard, where he has taught since 1968. He was also a student there, graduating summa cum laude with his bachelor's in mathematics and magna cum laude in law. Prior to joining the Harvard faculty, Professor Tribe clerked for the California and the US Supreme Courts. He's argued numerous high profile appellate cases, including 35 in the US Supreme Court. His treatise, American Constitutional Law, has been cited more than any other legal text since 1950. In 2010, Professor Tribe was appointed by President Obama, one of his former students, by the way, to serve as the first senior counselor for access to justice focused on enhancing legal services for the poor. His expertise as constitutional scholar has also been called upon by the global community. South Africa, the Czech Republic, and the Marshall Islands all sought his guidance when these nations set out to write their own constitutions. Please welcome Professor Lawrence Tribe here to USC. Sorry. <laughs> Guiding our conversation is one of our own preeminent faculty members, Professor Robert Schrum, the Carmus, Carmen and Lewis Warshaw Chair in Practical Politics. Most of you know Bob, at least from a distance. He's a leading voice in the national media with decades of experience in the DC trenches. Bob has been a strategist and consultant for almost countless list of candidates who ran for every office from mayor to president. Professor Schrum has recently taken on an additional role at Dornsife, serving as the director of the Jesse M. Unruh Institute of Politics. Here, he's helping us make a strong push in the arena of practical politics by bringing together folks from across the ideological spectrum for smart debate on the challenging issues we face today. For example, at our conference last April on Trump's first 100 days, Bob lined up a number of outstanding panels, including one in which Anthony Scaramucci, former communications director for the Trump administration, and Ron Klain, former chief of staff to both Joe Biden and Al Gore, sat at a table together, along with former, scholar, former US, so with scholars and a former US ambassador to debate President Trump in the world. It was a great discussion. Believe it or not, the room didn't burn down. We're living in a tremendously divisive moment, and that makes it more important today than ever before that we find ways to challenge each other to think intelligently about difficult ideas and to do it in a civil way. Of course, these discussions are going to be provocative, but that's what research universities are all about, learning to ask and respond to challenging questions that rise above partisanship. In this spirit, I encourage everyone to ask provocative questions of our guest tonight, a Russian Jewish kid from Shanghai who's taking on an American president. With that, I'll turn it over to Professor Tribe and to Professor Schrum. Thanks so much for that generous introduction, Dean Miller. Um, your distinguished work in physics and cosmology and astronomy frankly make me salivate. Cosmology is the subject I plan to pursue in my next life, God willing. <laughs> but that's another story. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here, uh, and all of us, I'm sure, have the victims of Harvey and Irma in our hearts today. We're very lucky, uh, and luck will be one of the themes I touch on, to be spared that particular devastation. And I want to thank Hope Warshaw for inviting me 
to deliver the Carmen and Lewis Warshaw Distinguished Lecture. I'm really humbled by the list of truly distinguished lecturers who preceded me. I think if I had seen the list before I accepted, I would have had second thoughts. I also want to thank Bob for generously agreeing to make this a conversation rather than a lecture, despite its formal title. I'd much rather talk with you and with everybody here uh, when we get a chance to do some Q&A rather than simply to talk at you. When Hope invited me to deliver a talk that turned out to land on 9-11, I couldn't help seeing and hearing that date through a lens that I had previously reserved only for December 7th, 1941, the date that FDR rightly said would live in infamy. September 11th, 2001 turned out to be another such date, both because of the thousands of violent and tragic deaths that it inflicted and because of the national security state and the national surveillance state that it inaugurated, laying the dangerous groundwork for selectively deploying fear of terrorism as a cover for what Timothy Snyder diagnoses so beautifully in his marvelous little book on tyranny, published earlier this year, a book that I recommend uh, to all of you. For me, at least, November 8th, 2016, was yet another date that will live in infamy. It's hard to believe that it was just a little over 300 days ago. It was, of course, the date that America wounded itself when it chose as its president a corrupt real estate developer and reality talk show host with no experience holding public office, no understanding of history or of our system of government, no commitment to our constitution or the rule of law, no moral compass and no beliefs in or loyalty to anything or anyone other than himself. But apart from that, he's just fine. Um, but I don't want to get ahead of myself by talking too much about Mr. Trump, a topic that I know Bob will want to ask me about. I'd rather spend a little time talking about what 9-11 meant to me and how its meaning related to my Jewish Shanghai roots, which Bob and I will also talk about shortly. Speaking of roots and 9-11, I was having a root canal. Uh, the moment the first tower, the North Tower of the World Trade Center was hit, the dentist's office had a TV in the reception room, and we heard loud gasps through the wall separating surgery from reception. The root canal procedure, needless to say, was mercifully put on hold. As the dentist and I ran into the room where other patients were watching in complete and utter disbelief. As I'm sure you will all remember, it was just before nine on a bright, clear morning 16 years ago today in both New York and Boston. We couldn't believe what our eyes were seeing as they were glued to the tube. Then minutes later, another plane hit the South Tower. I knew, as I think just about everybody did, that we were at war. I rushed home to watch the events of that tragic day unfold, and I found myself weeping, both for the 3,000 victims of terrorist murder in New York City, at the Pentagon, and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and for the thousands more who either lost a loved one or would spend the rest of their lives wondering, why not me? Why was I spared? Part of what went through my mind that day was something that I hadn't experienced directly, but had grown up living with ever since I was well under a year old. It was the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. Japan had occupied most of Southeast Asia, including most of Shanghai, in 1937. I was born in October 1941 in a Shanghai neighborhood that hadn't yet been occupied by the Japanese. I was just under a couple months old when my parents certainly knew that Japan's attack on the US naval base in the Pacific would represent a turning point in their lives, not to mention a turning point in the history of the world. They knew, as the Japanese brutally occupied all the rest of Shanghai, what probably awaited them 
my father, who had been born in a shtetl near what is now Pinsk in Belarus in 1903, had become a US citizen during a five-year stay here in California when he was in his 20s. They knew that he would almost certainly been, be taken prisoner by the Japanese, along with all other citizens of the Allied powers who were living in that part of China. That is, of course, what pretty much all nations do to the citizens of nations with which they are at war. Although, to our eternal shame, the United States went further and imprisoned even loyal American citizens just because they were of Japanese ancestry. What President Trump and Attorney General Sessions have threatened to do to millions of dreamers reminds me of that shameful roundup of innocent people just because of their Japanese origins. It was a roundup that to its eternal shame, our Supreme Court infamously upheld in Korematsu versus the United States, a case that has never been overruled. My father was neither of Japanese or Chinese origin nor of American origin. He was of Russian Jewish ancestry. His middle name was Israel. That meant that if he had not fled the Tsar's armies with his parents and settled in Harbin, Manchuria when he was a young teenager, he would have been exterminated by the Nazis, the way most members of my extended family were when Germany invaded Poland and Belarus in 1939. Being a US citizen, my dad realized that he would inevitably be imprisoned by the empire of Japan. It was only a matter of time. As it turned out, he was hauled off in early 1943 and remained in a Japanese concentration camp until it was liberated by the US military following the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the surrender of Japan in August of 1945. My father had the really good fortune of being a relatively poor car salesman rather than a prominent journalist or wealthy businessman. I say good fortune because as he and my mom had learned by the time my dad was taken prisoner, the Japanese made a regular practice of torturing the well-off or well-known Americans and Brits whom they imprisoned. My father very luckily wasn't tortured, but some of his very good friends and some who tried to escape that camp were. Near the war's end, as Japan's military might lay in tatters, families were allowed to visit prisoners like my father. And even though I was just a little kid, I remember our visit well. And what I remember a lot better than any of the visual details, which were pretty sordid, was my confusion and anger, really fury at the injustice of it all. I knew that my father had done nothing wrong. I certainly wasn't capable of understanding the international customs that doomed him to imprisonment anyway. But he had done nothing wrong personally, and whatever the customs of warfare between nation states, he hadn't done anything to justify being taken prisoner under horrendous conditions and separated from my mom and from me. If first Harbin and then later Shanghai had been as unwelcoming to Jewish and other refugees as America and Britain had been during World War II, or as America is starting to become again under President Trump, we would surely have perished. I later learned just how fortunate my family and all the Jews of Shanghai were that the Japanese chose not to cooperate with Joseph Meisinger, the infamous butcher of Warsaw. Heinrich Himmler, you see, had sent Meisinger to Shanghai as chief representative of the Gestapo with the mission of exterminating all of us as part of the so-called final solution. I've since learned that the plan, and it was well worked out, was to put all 7,000 of us, give or take, into leaky boats 
that they intended to send out to sea and then sink with all the Jews on board. The plan was to have us all perish on Passover. Another close call in my life occurred when the US forces liberated Shanghai from the Japanese with bombing raids in late summer 1945. And I remember them well. I clearly recall, as if it were very recent, the sound, the tremor, and the smell of smoke of the explosions and the heat and the dust as the houses to our immediate right and left were demolished by American bombs. Ours somehow was spared. One of the American pilots dropping those bombs on Shanghai, as I learned just by accident on my way to argue a case in the Supreme Court in January 1987 with the CEO of a company I was representing, in his limo, I wanted to make small talk. I don't like to talk about a case I'm about to argue. Where were you when? Where were you? Where were you? Well, it turned out he was one of those pilots flying over the international concession where we lived in Shanghai. Hugh Lidke, a man who later became the CEO of Pennzoil and my client in the case of Pennzoil versus Texaco. More about that case in a few minutes if Bob wants to ask me about it, but it was just the sense of serendipity, the odd, bizarre coincidence of this pilot not having aimed his bomb at our house, you know? And I survived, and here I was representing him in a really important Supreme Court case. It was, it was almost too much. And that is probably the main thing that ultimately led me into law. It was a combination of those close calls and a mounting sense of injustice and accident that my Jewish roots as a refu Russian refugee born in war-torn Shanghai instilled in me. And that is probably the main thing that led me after detours through art and then work toward a PhD in mathematics to the practice of constitutional law with an emphasis on vindicating the rights of people who deserved a better break than the one that fate and human evil and greed had given them. From what my parents, although not my rabbi, another story altogether, <laughs> taught me about our Jewish roots, the two deepest traditions of our culture, and to us it was a lot more a culture than a religion, were the search for justice and the hunger for learning and truth. And maybe the deepest obligation was to pay forward through public service, whatever good fortune one had experienced. I learned in particular that I hadn't earned whatever talents I had or whatever narrow escapes I was lucky enough to benefit from. Those were the gifts of the universe, as a physicist or cosmologist like Dean Miller might see them, or maybe of the Almighty, as a spiritual leader of the Jewish or another faith might see them. But in any event, they were not anything to which I was entitled. So they were reasons to try to make things better for others, not to exult in my advantages over them or, worst of all, my dominion over anybody. And that's why, as I thought over the legal cases that I've done in the Supreme Court and in lower courts, most of them pro bono, I realized what the common theme was. They were cases in which I was representing what I thought were the rights of people who might otherwise have been squashed by the system. Migrant farm workers suing agribusiness, black and Hispanic school children here in LA suing the unified school district for obstructing efforts at integration, women seeking abortion counseling, challenging the Reagan administration's gag order, minority-owned construction contractors in Boston defending affirmative action, Muslim victims of the Trump administration's grotesquely discriminatory travel ban, which is now about to be considered more fully by the US Supreme Court. Dreamers 
challenging the unfair bait and switch cancellation of their protected status. A Cambridge restaurant challenging a state law giving churches a power to veto liquor licenses sought by nearby establishments. School teachers challenging an Oklahoma law that excluded them from the high school classroom if they told their students there's nothing wrong with homosexuality. A gay man challenging a Georgia law criminalizing oral sex. Same-sex couples arguing for marriage equality. Newspapers challenging their exclusion from criminal trials. What gives me a really heavy heart these days is that so many valid constitutional claims like these will be rejected by a Supreme Court filled with justices like Gorsuch, nominated either by Trump or by Pence. It's just a reality. It's one that I don't try to hide from my students. I tell them that what this means is they will just have to work harder. Think of the long term. Think of ways to enlist public support, to enlist state courts and state constitutions and lawmakers. Giving up just is not an option. But I should stop there and let Bob take over because there's plenty to discuss and I know you'll have some questions perhaps about our current president. Thank you all very much. <laughs> I should start off by saying that uh, Larry is my oldest friend, uh, and it's a friendship. Oldest in several ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, I resemble that remark. Uh, <laughs> and it's a friendship that's lasted and lifted me for 55 years. Uh, when I first knew you, you were just out of college, a year after winning the National College Debate Championship. Uh, you graduated summa cum laude in mathematics before you strayed to the law. Uh, and You'd gone to high school in San Francisco where you lived in a house in the sunset, which I still remember because we visited together. It looked like a quintessential American success story of the 1950s and 1960s. It wasn't always that way, and you've eloquently just shared that story with us, and thank you. I want to recall something else I did with you. In 1981, we visited Israel together. Uh, and it was not long after you'd written that landmark treatise on constitutional law. I remember how moved you were as our plane touched down. Uh, and I had never thought of you as, a, as, a, as, a, as an observant Jew. You certainly weren't. But I never thought of you as that conscious of your Jewish roots. And that day was amazing to me. You kissed the ground. Uh, so. You've mentioned your roots, and I saw that day, and I wonder how that identity pushes you to defend and expand the rights of vulnerable people, of so many people who may have no one else to speak for them. I mean, you were there at the beginning in the fight, legal fight for, for gay rights. You know, I've always thought of it as a seamless, seamless web. I mean, I didn't really have an idea of how moving it would be for me to, I, I was almost tempted to say return to Israel. I'd never been to Israel. My grandfather was a Zionist and a Marxist, which is why he couldn't emigrate to the United States when my parents came here. Um, I always thought of myself as Jewish, but in the sense that what else could I be? I mean, I'm Jewish. but. The fact that there is this place where Jews could go when even Shanghai or Harbin would not take them in just moved me in a way I had never expected it to move me. And I thought, there are so many people who have no place to go. I mean, gays in America who are ostracized, now trans people who Trump wants to drum out of the military. Half the population, women, who are in danger of losing their control over their reproductive Right, rights, their bodies, their selves, their lives, blacks, Hispanics. It's always struck me that the nature of tyranny, of fascism, 
of a certain virulent kind of xenophobic nationalism is to sort of go after the vulnerable, scapegoat them, pursue them, persecute them. It's, it's nice to be able to distract the population by sort of harping on its sense of grievance and deprivation. And so for me, the defense of people against racism, anti-Semitism, uh, homophobia, it, it was all of a piece. And the fact that I could do something in, in that world, uh, which I couldn't do as a mathematician. I was pretty good, but I was no genius. I couldn't improve the world. But here was something that I could do that would improve the lives of people one by one, sometimes in groups. And if I hadn't myself been part of what I understood and my parents certainly understood as a persecuted minority, I don't know that I would have been driven by that kind of fire, There's the sense that, that when I leave this earth, I really do want a lot of people who otherwise might not have had some of the opportunities that I did to, to experience them. I've always felt so incredibly lucky. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not uh, enjoying other people's bad fortune. It's not that, but when you see what happens to people. I mean, you know, in, in Houston, when a dozen, two dozen, four dozen people were, were killed by that flood, at the same time, very few Americans knew that 1,200 people had died on the other side of the world from terrible flooding. To me, it's all the same. They're all human beings. They all deserve defense from misfortune, especially misfortune visited on them by human malice, by greed. And so if I could make a difference in that way, whether as a Jew, as an American, as a lawyer, or law professor, that was what I had to do. Uh, before I go further into that, and I actually want to build a bridge from what you said about not being, you know, being pretty good at mathematics. When you got to San Francisco, how old were you? I was five and a half. Uh, did, did, did you speak any English? No, I refused to learn English in our little kindergarten, where I still have, I have the certificate saying that, that Larry is not very obedient. <laughs> uh, he, he also doesn't have much fine muscle coordination, and he can't carry a tune. But it was the disobedient thing. And I wouldn't learn English. I just, my parents spoke Russian at home. They spoke a little Japanese, no Chinese, which told me something about European imperialism in China at, at that time. I mean, we had a Chinese ama, but we didn't really communicate with her. Um, but I didn't speak any uh, English. And when we came to San Francisco, none of my little friends spoke Russian. So I felt like a real schmuck. I mean, I was, I was ostracized not only as a Jew, but as some kind of foreign creature. Um, but I resisted. But eventually, and so I didn't talk at all. I mean, nobody thought I was exactly mute. But I didn't really talk. And, but I absorbed a fair amount. And then at some point, when I was about eight, I think, I started talking a blue streak in English. Um, and I still sort of can understand Russian, but I, and my accent is OK. But my vocabulary is limited, and I can't speak it very well. So you did feel some sense of otherness. Oh, yeah. I was also I was a little fat kid, and I was sort of nerdy. And I wasn't I really, resemble all that, too. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and I wasn't very good at sports. And because I it was accelerated through school, I had a hard time getting girls because I was always too young. And when I went to Harvard at 16, you know, they wanted to date guys who were 18, 19. And so I really had a tough time. <laughs> uh -huh. Somebody once said, I'd be, I'd be older, but I've been sick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did, how did you become, in that period, aware of the Shoah? Uh... Well, I couldn't really believe it, but my parents really made me aware of what we knew about the, the uh, liberation of the concentration camps. You know, and I, I saw the bodies crumpled, even as they were still alive, crumpled in, in uh, deprivation. And I saw the, the pits. and. I was aware from a very young age of what human beings can do to one another. 
And I refused to believe there was anything genetic about the Germans that made them different. And so from a very young age, I thought, you know, there is something of, the, of that terrible potential in all of us if we're brought up in a way that, that makes pe people not empathize with one another. That's, I mean, honestly, that is what bothered me most about Trump. It was nothing legal. It was his inhumanity. I mean, the thing that really did it for me was watching him mock that disabled reporter, watching him make fun of a disabled reporter. I thought anybody who can do that could put people, could march them into the ovens easily. Now, I don't lightly compare anyone to Hitler. I'm not saying that Trump is himself literally a Nazi. But when he could see those Nazis marching on the campus in Charlottesville and say, there were some really good people among them. You know, why didn't they leave that mob if there were such good people? It's that inhumanity that I became aware of very young and that I realized we have to fight in ourselves. I mean, I didn't always do a good job fighting. It, in the sixth grade, there was a kid that I just didn't like. I do not like the Dr. Fell, the reason why I cannot tell. Well, there's this kid named Arnold that I didn't like. And one day, I snuck into the coat, coat room and stole his leather jacket, which I coveted, and snuck down the hall and put it into the toilet and flushed. And I got in trouble, really a lot of trouble, because the water came down the hallway and into Mrs. McLean's classroom. But I got a certain thrill out of doing that to Arnold's, Arnold's jacket. Now, that told me that there is something even in me that is really shitty and nasty. And I, I, need, to, I need to be better than that. Now, there are some people who never recognize that about themselves and who exult in their own worst tendencies. And that is really what we have to fight. Okay, I wanna, I wanna bridge from that and, and, and back into Harvard College and math. You said you were pretty good at it. I, my recollection is that your senior thesis uh, solved an algebraic problem nobody had solved for several hundred years. But it wasn't that big a problem. It wasn't a big problem, <laughs> but it was an unsolved problem, and I was intrigued by it, so I asked if I could read it. I got to about halfway down page one, <laughs> when, as far as I could tell, it was all hieroglyphics. But did any The secret of, is I can't get me uh, much beyond page one anymore either. Uh, but did any of that, the, the mathematical training, the interest in science uh, and art, uh, have an influence on the work you've done? I think, for example, of a piece you wrote with a law student who was your assistant named Barack Obama, entitled The Curvature of Constitutional Space. Right. Uh, and the subtitle was What Lawyers Can Learn from Modern Physics. And Barack was one bright kid. I mean, he was a wonderful research assistant my main one from 1989 to 1990. And I was deeply engaged in how various kind of mathematical constructs could shape our understanding of law. And in that article with Obama's help, I tried to show how our insensitivity to the way pe people can be harmed by the whole shape of the legal system and not by any one cop kind of punching them out how they can be harmed by rules that say, if you hear a kid crying out at home, just rely on the social services. They'll take care of it. Don't enter the home. That's a violation of the trespass laws. So in a case where the Supreme Court said just that, I tried to ex explore, with Obama's help, the way in which that really comes out of a Newtonian earlier way of thinking about, about the universe, in which if a force doesn't directly impact an object that there's, there's nothing going on. Whereas the legal system itself is part of the universe we construct and it traps people and constrains them in various ways. So mathematical and cosmological concepts, though they didn't translate directly into law, have always shaped my way of thinking about law. And that's why I do all these funny diagrams when I'm teaching students about legal concepts. I mean, the Venn diagram and other rather more complicated structures matter as much to me in clarifying legal ideas 
uh, as anything that can be written down in a, in a string of textual marks. Um, and it's in that way that mathematics made a difference, not in any way that's quantitative or that involves counting anything. It's the fascination with structures and the way structures can be kind of invariant under various kinds of changes. So that it's always influenced the way I've thought about law. Okay, let me go to some of the Supreme Court cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually want to ask a couple of questions about that, one question about Trump, and then turn it over to this audience. Uh, are there two or three Supreme Court cases you've argued that you would single out as the most interesting, personally memorable to you, most important ones you've been sure. involved in, and why? Well, the one that I can never forget is the first one that I argued, and I can't forget it partly because my father died just 10 days before I had to argue the case. And at first I was, I mean, he died very suddenly on, on his 40th wedding anniversary. I had, we had no idea it was coming. And I just wanted to mourn, basically. I didn't want to argue some damn Supreme Court case. But the court uh, has its own tempo, and they would not postpone the argument. Um, and in the end, that case, it's called Richmond Newspapers against Virginia. It involved the right of the press and the public uh, to observe criminal trials. Ended up meaning a huge amount to me. First of all, it was a, when the court agreed with that proposition, that there is that right, it was reversing lots of precedent. And it was doing it partly because I think I was able to convey to the conservatives as well as the liberals that the right to observe a trial, even when the defendant would rather keep it private and when the prosecution was happy keeping it private and the judge says, I don't want the public here, a lot of the people who have a right to see it are the victims, the relatives of the victims. In that particular case, it was the relatives of a woman who had been murdered. And I fastened on their right, the right of victims, to see justice done. And that meant a huge amount to me. I was able to take my grief and my sympathy for victims and translate it into a constitutional doctrine that also became the first time in really ever that the Supreme Court paid real attention to the Ninth Amendment, which is sort of my favorite all-time favorite part of the Constitution. It's the part that says it's not all written down. It says that the fact that some right isn't actually written down there, like the right to observe justice done, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You can't move from an absence to a conclusion of non-existence. Most of what's really important about our Constitution isn't written down at all, like the fact that we are, you can't secede from the Union. It's written, if it is, only in blood at Gettysburg, not in ink on parchment. And so all of those things sort of came out of that case and the traumatic experience that I lived through in the course of doing it. So that was one. Um, I mean, I could talk about a lot of, obviously, another pair of cases that meant a huge amount to me were Bowers v. Hardwick and then Lawrence v. Texas. In Bowers, I, presented, I was representing a gay guy who had been followed home from a gay bar by a cop who basically watched him have oral sex with, his, with the guy he had picked up. And I thought that the issue there was, I mean, the Constitution doesn't say you have a right to have oral sex. It doesn't say anything about it. It doesn't say you have freedom of thought either. But I thought the question in the case was not, what was he doing with his buddy? But what was the state of Georgia doing in their bedroom? That is, it had no right to be there. There was a fundamental principle of human dignity, privacy, personality that was involved. Now, I, I didn't think we had any chance of winning the case. We didn't win it. But I thought we would get some powerful dissents that would later become the law. And sure enough, that's what happened. Justices like Brennan and Marshall and Stevens dissented. That became the law later. And Blackman uh, dissented. That became the law in Lawrence v. Texas, where I represented the ACLU as their chief representative in the Supreme Court. So that meant a great deal to me. And there were lots of others for different reasons. That, and I could go on you know, much too long, so I won't. But Can I ask you about Bush v. Gore? Yeah, which not, has one a of, little, not, not one of my favorites. Yeah, but. It has, a, has, has well, the opinion was certainly not my favorite. I'm, guess it would be my least favorite. Uh, 
You argued the first case, which was won, and David Boyce argued the second case, which was not. Mm -hmm. Is there any argument <clears throat> that you think could have been made that wasn't that might have made any difference? Or, or were the justices yeah. just going to vote on party well, lines? You know, I don't, I'll never know. I don't think anybody will ever know what might have changed Justice Kennedy's vote. But the only argument I thought worth making, which was one I spent all night coaching David to make, um, or at least I thought I was coaching him to make it, is an argument he didn't make. And that was, if it does violate principles of equality to have this strange way of counting ballots in Florida, where they were recounting some but not others, they were holding ballots up to the air and looking to see if the chads were hanging all the way out of the holes, you know, it looked like chaos to the justices. If that violates equal protection, then doesn't it violate equal protection even more to just arbitrarily stop the counting two hours before midnight? It was kind of an obvious point, and I tried to explain how you could work that in, and it really never made it. Um, I always thought, I mean, I think Bob was, he was in the room when it happened in the sense that I, he was involved in the process. I think he was one of the ones who told Al Gore that the court wouldn't really care to hear from somebody who wasn't a constitutional expert just because he knew about trials and knew what was going on in the ground in, in, uh, in Florida. But in the end, other views prevailed. Ron Klain also tried to persuade, I think, the then vice president that I should argue the second case. I'll never know, honestly, if it would have made a difference. I kind of think it probably wouldn't because I think Kennedy is smart enough to have thought of that argument on his own. And the court had possible answers that I won't go into. But I've always told myself I'll never know what would have happened. And that's how I still feel. I, I do not, however, agree with Alan Dershowitz and a lot, of, a lot of other law professors that the court was acting purely out of partisan whim, uh, that they wanted Bush to be president rather than Gore, so they made up something. I don't think that's right. I think unconsciously they might have convinced themselves of other arguments, but there were other arguments. The court made them. It had jurisdiction to hear the case. I think it was a lousy opinion, but I'm not ready to say that the court was just a bunch of political hacks. Uh, I'm going to ask you one more question and then turn this over mm -hmm. to the audience. Uh, you want to talk about some of the legal efforts you're involved in with respect to President Trump? Sure. You've given us some sense of your opinion of him. Yeah, it I've, seems. And if you ask me what I really think, <laughs> you might hear even more. Um, no, yeah, I'm doing a, a lot of stuff from the moment that he won, which shocked me as much as it shocked most people. Uh, I started forming coalitions with other lawyers who were equally shocked um, and also very experienced uh, to challenge a lot of what he was doing. We knew from the day he won that he was unlikely to divest himself of all his companies all over the world. And many of them were, even then, but even more so after the inauguration, sucking money like a magnet out of foreign governments that were trying to curry favor with him. Now, that's not just asinine or, or corrupt. It's clearly unconstitutional. It violates something that most people hadn't heard of before, and that is the Foreign Emoluments Clause. People think of it as you know, something about uh, body lotion or, you know. <laughs> but there is a clause that, that the framers cared a lot about. They were worried about foreign governments currying influence with the American president so that when the American president makes a deal with Turkey, nobody knows whether it's because Trump thinks it's in our interest or because his hotel in Istanbul is a big deal. And he had this project now that we know about to build a massive hotel, the biggest in the world, in Moscow. And we don't know what all of the things are that made him suck up so shamelessly to Putin, the one guy he never criticizes, but the project in Moscow might have been part of it. So one of the things we're doing, and we filed the lawsuit on the first working day of his presidency on January 23rd of this year, is getting a court to hold uh, that it violates the, there are really two emoluments clauses, it violates those clauses uh, 
for the president to hold on to these companies, regardless of whether he has his, his two sons, his two older sons, run them or not. We're also suing, I've been involved in the suits against him, uh, claiming, arguing that the travel ban was really a very poorly disguised anti-Muslim measure. Um, I'm bringing lawsuits with various groups against the way he's treated dreamers in disregarding DACA. Um, and I'm involved in lawsuits that are being brought against him by the attorneys general of Maryland and the District of Columbia and by a number of, of states. So there's a lot of stuff that I, that I have, a lot of irons in the, in the fire. Um, and I'm hoping that one or another of them will, will help to bring this presidency to an end. In terms of, the, and this is just a little follow-up on that, mm -hmm. in terms of the personal uh, uh, issues that might get him into legal trouble, uh, and I'm thinking of the Mueller investigation, for example, uh, are there any legal impediments to him just presumptively pardoning a whole, preemptively pardoning a whole group of people, including himself? Right. Well, I've, I've argued in an op-ed that, that a self-pardon would be something that a court would disregard, that it's an unconstitutional. Um, and a number of people say, well, where do you find that in the Constitution? Well, as you've seen, my theory of how to read the Constitution and much of what the court has done wouldn't make sense if you had to find everything in chapter and verse. You find it in the structure. Um, he couldn't just pardon himself. He could certainly issue pardons to Don Jr. and, and Eric and Ivanka and to you know, Flynn and, and Manafort. And he could hand them out. And worse than that, he could dangle the prospect of pardons in front of people to get them not to cooperate with Mueller. And he could tell them, when you are subpoenaed, don't worry about being held in contempt. I'll pardon you if you are. The Arpeo pardon, which I'm also involved in helping to challenge, was a great example of that. But one little silver lining is Eric Schneiderman, and other state attorneys general. That is, a president does not have the power to pardon people for violating state laws. And state laws against financial manipulation carry much stiffer penalties than a lot of federal laws. So with the combination of Eric Schneiderman, the Attorney General of New York, and Robert Mueller, uh, there's no way that Trump can get out from under all of it. Uh, and besides, as the framers said in various very dramatic ways, even if a president has the power to pardon, abuse of power is the essence of an impeachable offense. He can pardon people, but if it becomes clear that that's part of a pattern of obstructing justice, I guarantee you that that'll be among the articles of impeachment that a Democratic House after the midterm elections next year <laughs> will include. Uh, on both personal grounds and principled ones, I'm glad that the bomb dropped by your future client didn't hit your house in Shanghai. <laughs> uh, now I'd like to turn this over to the audience and let people ask questions. By the way, I wish I could have asked you a lot of questions, but I think the, the whole theme is That was sort of invert the, and, and actually yeah. defy the meaning of the lecture. <laughs> Although Ehud Barak once told me that my family obviously was Jewish, that <laughs> there, there, a, a German army had ridden through a village somewhere around 1500 and said, Rabbi Shrum, be Christian or be dead. So there I was. Uh, okay, yes, sir. Time. How do you look at uh, the human rights situation of the Palestinians versus the... Well, I'm, I'm very troubled. I'm not a fan of Netanyahu. I, I think that Israel has abandoned at least some of its moral compass in the way it's treated Palestinians. It's much too easy for me to judge from a distance. I don't pretend to be able to second guess everything. The existential peril in which Israel finds itself uh, is certainly a conundrum to beat all others that I know of. But I find myself very much in sympathy with a lot of Palestinians whose houses are taken and not compensated the way the Supreme Court of Israel has said they should be, and with people who have known no other home. I mean, it's, 
It's a terrible dilemma. In many ways, there's nothing in the world as complicated as Jerusalem. Um, and so I'm not going to pretend that I know what to do about it, but I'm certainly not sympathetic with those who say that the Palestinians are, are usurpers and that because they threw the first stone, uh, it's okay to stone them. Someone on this side, yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I have a question about the First Amendment. You know, we saw the horror of uh, Charlottesville, and uh, you know, many of us would regard the just allowing those, you know, the the neo-fascists to to march there as an abuse of the First Amendment. Would you agree? Well, it's a complicated question to which I don't have a yes or no answer, but I can certainly say that the First Amendment has limits. I can certainly say that marching with torches on a university campus with Nazi slogans, with essentially not just expressing a point of view, but riling up hatred and inciting violence, goes beyond the protection of at least what I understand the First Amendment to be. When the Nazis marched in Skokie, that was disgusting as well. But I agreed with the Supreme Court's invalidation of the particular measures that Skokie was taking to try to silence them. They set up a licensing scheme that was vague and broad and that involved prior censorship. I mean, if some community were to say, you can't march through here if you are a member of a Nazi-related organization, I think that would be unconstitutional. If it, were to, if it were to make it a crime to deny the Holocaust, the way every country in Europe does, although we don't, I think that would violate a First Amendment principle. I mean, if somebody wants to deny, if somebody wants to say the earth is flat, that's their right, even though that's less hateful a falsehood than, than denying the reality of the Holocaust. But it's one thing to have your own version of, of the facts, the way our president does, or Kellyanne Conway with her alt facts. You have a right to your stupid facts. But it's another thing to incite violence, the way Trump did at many of his rallies, the way he does now by effectively creating a moral equivalence between the people who marched with swastikas and torches and the people who fought back against them. So I do think that there is room in the doctrine of the First Amendment without giving up an open and free society and the principle of, of open dialogue. There's still room to, you know, to take the old chestnut to say you can't yell fire in a crowded theater and cause a panic when there is no fire. Sure. And one of the cases that you argued was the restaurant and the religious mm -hmm. institution, and that was one of the 35 that you argued. And it was decided uh, on a church and state mm -hmm. basis. I'm concerned that today's right wing is blurring the distance between church and state. And I wonder if you feel the same way, and if so, is there any kind of case in the offing that will sort of define that in a better way? Thank you. Well, there are cases that could define it in a better way, but unfortunately, we don't have a Supreme Court that is likely to f see things the way I think you appear to and the way I do. I mean, there is a case of the, the Masterpiece Cake case where this guy says, you know, even though there is a local law against discriminating based on sexual orientation, it violates my religion to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. Now, if he said, I will not bake a wedding cake for Jews, or I will not bake a wedding cake for blacks, no one would say that just because your excuse is religious, you can violate the laws against discriminating in commerce. And I think I've therefore joined in an amicus brief urging the court to rule against the guy who says he has a right you know, to limit the cakes he bakes uh, to opposite sex couples. But I'm not particularly hopeful about the outcome. It's going to be probably five to four. Kennedy is likely to cast the decisive ballot. I don't think that justices like Gorsuch, Alito, Thomas are likely to vote that the freedom of religion does not give you a right to injure others. It's, it's too simple to say, but basically freedom of religion 
is a shield, not a sword. You impose your religion on others in violation of an otherwise valid anti-discrimination law, and you should be prevented from doing that. That's at least my view. And I'm trying to persuade the court of that view, but I do think it's going to be uphill. OK, back here. Yes, uh, oh, you're both, you both have your hands up. I'm sorry. Go ahead. My question, my question is about um, the tension between affirmative action and um, individual opportunity. Many of the elite universities are now facing this, uh, Harvard among them, uh, questions about uh, Asians and whether they are being discriminated against uh, in an attempt to uh, keep numbers balanced. Well, it's a tough question. I'm a little inhibited in answering it because I'm helping Harvard defend against that lawsuit, but I'm, again, not so optimistic, um, partly because even though the court in the second appearance of the Fisher case from the University of Texas has maintained by a thread the possibility of taking race into account as one factor out of many in attempting to maximize diversity. That thread is a narrow one, and I don't think that Kennedy is going to stay on the court much longer, probably another year. And it's clear that another justice and the whole idea of affirmative action taking personal history into account is going to be collapsed. What that will leave in its wake is very hard to say. I mean, are we going to say that legacy admits, which are not sort of meritocratic, that they are unconstitutional, that athletic admits are unconstitutional? I know all the arguments about how that's different from taking ethnicity or race or nationality into account. But if we don't want to have a purely elite society in which disadvantages are perpetuated and diversity is an elusive goal, we may need to do things that the current court will say just are not acceptable. And I do see both sides of that issue. There are many sides. Um, but if what you want is a prediction about a particular case, I really can't, can't be of help. Uh, speaking of diversity, uh, yeah, I've noticed I'm, that. I'm, there, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to rem I was affirmative action trying to remedy it. <laughs> um, thinking several Which of us has to become a woman? <laughs> <laughs> thinking several moves down the chessboard, as you are undoubtedly doing, if attempts to remove Trump from office should succeed, might we inherit an even worse scenario with a unified Republican conservative president and Congress who are in alignment? Well, I'm exploring questions just like that in a book that I'm in the process of writing called To End a Presidency, The Power of Impeachment. You can find it on Amazon. You can buy it in advance. <laughs> it's not coming out till spring. Uh, but I think it may help answer a lot of questions like that. Impeachment is not a silver bullet. It's not a panacea. We obviously don't want to do it as a first resort, only a last resort when constitutional crises mount and threaten to become sort of catastrophic and uncontrollable. That said, there is never going to be an easy answer. I mean, the, pers the, the line of succession uh, is not an easy answer, although the people who say, I don't really want President Ryan, even though it looks like Mike Pence is going to be embroiled in various ways, along with Donald Trump in the Russia thing, uh, they may not be calculating right either. It might be President Pelosi, because she might become Speaker of the House if the Democrats take over the House. There's also a provision in the Constitution for a special election in the event that the President and Vice President are both removed. And that election need not be a quadrennial election. It's not likely that this Congress will take advantage of that legislative option. But there are so many variables in the picture. But one thing I would caution, I, I think impeachment is a serious enough thing. Ending a presidency, as Benjamin Franklin said long ago, is really the, our alternative to assassination. And we don't want to 
basically do it in circumstances that in the effort to heal the country will cause bloodshed and revolution. But anyway, it's got to be done cautiously. The point of our book is going to be to explore what I would call the ecology or the sociology of impeachment and not just the, the legal technicalities because it's an essentially political process. But one of the things we have to do is agree not to think about it in terms of just policy outcomes. That is, we really have to ask, is this something we would do, even if the shoe were on the other foot, regardless of what we think of the policies that would be pursued by a Pence or by a Pelosi or by anybody else? And unless we do that behind a kind of veil of ignorance, then impeachment, which is our last resort, will become a form of Russian roulette, and it will become promiscuously used or never used at all, and both of those extremes would be terrible. One last question, and we, yes, you're standing up. <laughs> what do you think are the chances of getting Obama into the Supreme Court, and what can the public do to help that? What do I think are the chances of Obama being appointed to the court? Yes. Presumably by a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know what the chances are of another Democrat being elected. I'm focused more on that. I think Obama would not enjoy being a judge. I mean, when he was my research assistant, he was very judicious, very balanced. And as president, he came off that way. On the one hand, on the other hand, you know, he might as well have been wearing black robes rather than, rather than a tan suit. But it seems to me that he is, at heart, much much too much an activist to want to be a reflective judge. That is, he wants, especially after so much of his legacy will, be, will have been ripped apart. I mean, even if Obamacare is not repealed, it will be effectively defunded. The amount of damage that this administration and its likely successor, if Trump doesn't last all eight years, will do below the radar through dismantling regulations, defunding programs, ripping apart things like DACA is so overwhelming that I think his agenda will be much more, what can we do about gerrymandering on the ground? What can we do about the problems of immigrants? What can we do about a problem I worked with him on when I joined the administration, access to justice? What can we do about things that require an active engagement more than a passive reflection? So I don't really see Obama being on the court, but he would make a great justice. Do you have any final words for us? <laughs> well, it's been an honor, a pleasure. Um, I, I wish I could spend more time with you and ask you, Bob, how you've managed to transform yourself from the leading political activist to a professor. Um, and I gather from everybody that you do it brilliantly, and it doesn't surprise me. Uh, we could talk about a lot of personal things, how when we drove across the country together, <laughs> I didn't know whether the sun sets in the west or in the east. No, now, let's get this story right. <laughs> so we're pulling out of a <laughs> motel in Ten Sleep, Nebraska. There is such a town. And we pull to the, the entrance to Route 40, and Larry said, which way do I turn? Now, we were headed for Boston. <laughs> I said, well, the turn in the direction of the sun. The sun rises in the east. He was not aware of that. <laughs> I was only 20. <laughs> anyway, there's, it, uh, this has been spectacular. And on behalf of Hope, the University of, uh, D D Dean Miller, the University of Southern California, thank you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.